Hello there. Thanks for checking out another episode of the Restoration Today podcast. Today, we're talking new things, new innovations in the industry and getting paid and making it easier to get paid. It's always a great topic. So I am excited to be joined by Mark Watley, who is the founder and president of Surety and also the VP of Surety, Sean Duffy. We are going to talk about what this technology is and how it can help contractors and homeowners and carriers, everybody involved in the claims process, kind of expedite that payment process when there's a mortgage lender involved in on the check. So, all right, I want to start from the beginning though. So I'm going to toss it over to Sean first to have Sean introduce himself a little bit and share a little bit about your background. Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks for having us. Really excited uh, to talk about what we've been building for a while. Finally. Um, yeah, finally. <laughs> we've been holding this in our back pocket for, uh, for you, what, two and a half years for me, about eight months less than that, a full year almost. Um, I actually came from the uh, campaign space in uh, politics. Uh, so that was my uh, career for about 10 years. And then basically on election day, I got a call from a guy who um, I didn't know, had no idea who this guy was. Uh, he gave me a call, said, hey, I'm looking for someone who can do a lot of different things all at the same time and can learn on the go. You have it, Your name has come up a couple of times from people I know. Do you want to sit down and chat? And I told him, hey, I've got a little bit of a deadline here at 8 p.m. on the dot. Uh, cause it was literally on election day. Uh, can we talk tomorrow? Um, <laughs> and then a week and a half later, I was working, uh, here at surety, uh, as the first real full-time employee. And we started building something and really building upon what Watley had already done. Uh, and wow. Yeah. Year and a half later, here we are really, really excited, uh, by what we've already built and what we're going to build going forward. I've heard of some big, big leaps getting into the industry that might trump all of the leaps going from <laughs> political campaigns into that was good for you. I love that. I don't What's know that it's funny? that wacky. I mean, for the entrepreneurs that are listening to this, Michelle, it's really interesting to watch somebody run a campaign the way that Duffy does. It's such a visible role. Mm -hmm. And then you can reach out to somebody who you think is running a good campaign. And if you lose that campaign, you're basically unemployed. And so you can go, okay, well, I, I just saw your work product. That seemed compelling. There's a lot of reasons that very well-run campaigns don't win. Yeah. And we continue to hire. So here in San Diego, if I look out to my left and Duffy's right, we are only 25 yards away from each other right now. But in between him and I is a bunch of folks from politics. So we systemically hire out of that ecosystem uh, thoughtfully because I think that's an interesting way to observe somebody's work product and then yeah. work them in to the business if they all of a sudden they end up unemployed after the election. <laughs> you have to be innovative in a completely different way to be in politics and campaigning. Like it's PR to the extreme and constantly having to update. So I love it. Okay. All right, Watley. So go ahead and introduce yourself for people that don't know you and good luck keeping it to a minute. Ready? Go. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, I am a restorer at heart. So when everybody was in school, <laughs> And they were working at TGI Fridays. Uh, I was working for some big contractors. So fortunately, I learned how to build early. And I'm really grateful for that experience with some big builders here in San Diego. Uh, and ultimately, that ended up expressing itself quite um, in a compelling way. Like later in my career, I did some time in private equity space. And I had a few bucks in my pocket when that firm decided to uh, shut down. And so I'm like, okay, what do I know? I know how to build. And I, I, I kind of know my ways around the ones and zeros and, and finance to some extent. So what's going to be recession proof? Uh, Michelle, I am like a product of like that 2007 um, financial crisis, right? Can you imagine managing $19.8 billion and then going through that? It didn't matter where you were in the company. That was not fun. I remember us having like Dom Perry on in our fancy like conference room and it was for us like winning a deal or making a great trip. We never, we didn't open, nobody opened that refrigerator for like years. Like it was brutal. That's sad. So yeah, you just come out of like that environment <laughs> and you're like, okay, I need something that has some, uh, that's rather buoyant yep. um, when the economy takes a downturn. And so I kind of pragmatically like try to connect my skills that I developed with an industry that is known to be um, rather buoyant or resistant to downturns. But then and you couldn't just pick one thing. So we had to do packouts and a company and actionable and 
other companies. Yeah. I mean, I'm a GC. It's all the same thing to me. It's like in the same vertical. It's like, okay, I've got carriers here. I've got contractors here and then there's problems. And so what is actionable? It was just me getting 40 contractor friends Mm -hmm. in a room together, inviting four adjusters and having a conversation about like, Hey, would this be fair and reasonable if we build for this line and for a high grade shower surround or wouldn't it? While I was trying to do, I'm working in a cruddy warehouse with no air conditioning and I'm just trying to figure it out. But it seemed like we were arguing about things that were nonsensical to me. And so I'm like trying to solve that problem. And then as actionable, you go around, you train the 50 largest restorers in North America and some IA firms. And you ask a question before we start every engagement, Harrison, I like, if you could change one thing about how ACME contracting rights or settles claims, what would it be? And what happened? 25% of the time people, Michelle, were complaining about how they couldn't make their bonus because the mortgage company was encumbering their ability to get paid in a timely manner. So forget like the amounts of the monies. They, so many of the, the large players have moved towards a compensation structure. Um, Chris Hill did a good job of like putting this in place with pods and so on. He's mm-hmm. a consultant that's yep. trained a lot of the, the larger restorers, but you get paid more if you get the company paid within full within 30 days. Right. And then that the tier goes down, you get a negative X mod if it's at 60 days and at 90 days, you get more of a negative X mod. And after 90 days, you get no ability to participate in the gross profit by percentage. Right. So my heart goes out to these folks in the audience. They're just trying to make a living. They're trying to make their bonus and they can't because a mortgage company is withholding those funds. So if you're me, you're like, okay, but this is a problem to be solved. <laughs> like this is really bugging me. Uh, so, but it's a hard problem to solve for sure. And uh, I've been chipping away at it now for two years in earnest, like just sorting that issue out. So here we are today, but it's been like, one of a, a pretty damn best kept secret, Michelle, for a, a while. Uh, all of our clients have been under NDA and everybody was really honorable to us for allowing us to build quietly. Um, so no one knew what to attack, right? And so yeah. you're going to be the first one to tell the restoration ecosystem, property insurance ecosystem, what the heck we're up to. Well, I'm I'm excited. I will never forget you looking at me at RAA in 2020 and going, you still haven't figured me out yet, have you? I am like, oh. <laughs> never forgetting that comment. <laughs> like, that sounds I- awful. I don't like me very much right now. <laughs> it was I, I was like, damn, I'm allowed do I to be not? Here. So hopefully <laughs> yeah, can- I'm always up to something. I Every know. time everybody thinks I'm doing this thing, I'm probably so- doing something else. Uh huh. So what has it looked like over the last two years of developing this? platform and working with like, are you working directly with mortgage companies to try to get them on board plus the carriers and introduce it to all parties? Like, what did that look like? What does that look so like? So what we did is like, let's approach this from like the hardest possible check to process, which means I've got no relationship with a carrier nationwide check, no relationship, right? They don't care who Watley thinks he is or what surety is. And then that that one of the pays is going to be Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo is the second largest mortgage company in the United States. There's no way that we can penetrate that. So let's not even bother trying to approach them with a solution yet. Can we come in and work for some of the largest restorers in North America and function in a way where we're all we're trying, all we were trying to do at the outset is be like, can we use some technology to like accelerate the release of these claims proceeds with no relationship in place. Mm -hmm. And gratuitously, COVID just was this tailwind. Duffy's laughing because like, man, that was, I'm sorry. We got so lucky. Like Mm -hmm. if you ask me on a podcast, is this luck or hard work? I'm not going to give too much street cred to luck. Like it's, it's a lot of massive action and meets opportunity in my view, but holy, we can't take any responsibility for that. So we were like, well, this is silly sending people out to go inspect losses and the people going out inspecting losses, the mortgage companies found that to be really expensive. And so now they're withholding $750 unilaterally out of the claims process, the proceeds we're distributing, right? So that's a major problem. Some restorers mm-hmm. are pretty frustrated about that. Yep. Policyholders are eating it most of the time, but it's still creating a lot of tension between policyholders and contractors. You can see that, right? Yep. And anyhow, we're like, uh, hey, mortgage companies, Duffy's team is like, we have a geospatial scan that's showing that this property has been restored to pre-loss condition. They can't get any inspectors to go out to the property because it's COVID. 
policyholders don't want people in their house. Policyholders are the ones collecting that geospatial data. Like it just worked, doof, doof, doof. checked a lot of boxes. And all of a sudden we were there and I've always told our clients like, hey, our business is clunky right now, but it's less clunky than what you guys are doing without us. And at least we're a financial institution and we're treated as such by other banks. You're treated as a contractor. Yeah. It's totally different. And we're an unbiased third party that seems recognized by everybody uh, and swiftly. So I don't, know. I don't think we'd be here and have done the volume that we have done to date without COVID. But somehow our model and COVID just worked really, really well. It was definitely a leap that was uh, advanced by um, Matterport Geospatial Technology. Okay. So Duffy, can you talk about the process of what surety looks like? Let's say you are in a claim and I guess the customer gets the check that has the mortgage company on there. And now you need to figure out how to get release of that payment. So what does the process look like from the moment that check arrives, maybe with the property owner? Yeah, great question. And we've evolved this throughout the entire uh, time that we've been developing. So actually we can get involved and be part of the entire conversation from the moment uh project director, project manager shows up at someone's house just okay. to talk with them about, hey, we want to help you restore your property. But in this particular instance, let's say uh, already working on the claim, already working on the project, check's been cut, it's sitting there in the homeowner's hands. We can get involved right then and there by the homeowner downloading our app. As long as the contractor is also signed up, they take a picture of the check itself boom, it goes straight into our own system. We reach out immediately to the homeowner. We start communicating. We figure out all the necessary details so that your team as the contractor don't have to do that at all. We'll ask for the loan number. We'll ask for whatever their mortgage lender could possibly need. Uh, at this point, if we don't have a relationship with the mortgage lender, we need to utilize all that so that we can start talking with them. We'll figure out all the specific details based on you know, what's going on with their loan, et cetera. We'll put together the paperwork. We'll then send it to everyone for a signature. We take that all. We get it on over. We'll sit on the phone for four hours, two days, whatever we need to do. We'll wait for a call back, which- That happened. It happened. During COVID, it was intense. Often. It was wild. And a lot of these folks are trying their best at the mortgage lender angle to just make things function. But you can hear, you know- kids screaming in the background. And so sometimes you got to sit there for a little bit longer. Um, and that's what we're well equipped to do because we're able to speak to the lenders from a perspective that they understand and get. I I'm sure many people who are listening to this are thinking, oh, you know, I've tried to talk with lenders, but then they start asking for paperwork I've never even heard of. I have no clue. Like, what what's an asking. adjuster's worksheet to your average restorer right. or adjuster? Yep. Adjusters yeah. like my name's in it. And I don't even know what that is. Exactly. <laughs> but that's what lenders are asking for. But we, we've been yeah. able to figure out a lot of this. And so we'll like get to the bottom of it. We'll talk to the lenders at the language they understand. We'll go to the homeowner and we'll talk to them in a language that they'll get. We go to the contractor and do the same. We'll go back to the adjuster even and do the same. We'll collect everything for you. We'll reach out to the contracting team whenever we need something, you know, specific. Sometimes, hey, we need an update. You know, what's going on here? Are we at 50%? Cool. We can get that next disbursement moving out of mortgage lender. Or if we get all the funds completed and it's just sitting here uh, with surety, you tell us you reach 50%. You get us a scan showing that the um, property has been restored to 50. Boom. There's some money straight into your account. We'll ACH it to you. We do all of this all the way until the end where we do require a fully signed certificate of completion from the property owner and from the contractor. So everyone's happy. Everyone knows where the money's going to go. As soon as that happens, scans completed in our system to protect everyone involved here. Money goes out. Everyone's happy. Property is restored. Contractor has been paid in full. Property owner didn't have to deal with 90% of the craziness that's involved in the entire process. Yep. So who is who and the parties involved is paying for surety's involvement? the one that's experiencing the most pain. So when we set out to build this, we're like, what is the job to be done? And mm -hmm. like these poor project managers and estimators weren't making their bonus, but also the owners, like they were mm -hmm. experiencing a lot of hardship in terms of time weighted cost of capital, their aging reports getting extended out. And that was painful. But when we got onto the hood of it, it was more than that. It's, Policyholders, when they do a bunch of work to extract money out of the mortgage company, like the more you harm a policyholder, the more like soft fraud, moral hazard emerges. And, and adjusters are, um, you know, at risk of that those consequences. Mm -hmm. 
and those behaviors, but so are contractors. And so if the policyholder feels like harmed throughout the process, they start doing things like, hey, I know that painting this kitchen was beyond the scope of work, but can you just do this because this didn't go great? And I and they're withhold they're holding all that money and they worked for that money to get it from the mortgage company, right? And uh, you have situations where collecting that deductible, we're bad salespeople in this industry uh, generally. And we come in and we go, oh, well, yeah, we're just going to, don't worry about anything, Michelle. We're just yeah. going to bill the insurance company and like just totally omit the conversations around collecting the deductible. And there's that's why tension can emerge, right, between mitigation and repair side of the house because repairs trying to collect their $5,000 deductible, that's the difference of making money or losing money on that job. And nobody talked to them about that at the outset. And then all of a sudden, you know, there's no mitigation repair jobs ever gone perfectly. Like if you're listening to this and you're a restorer and you're going to tell me a job went perfectly, I'm gonna call you a liar. Like <laughs> it's impossible in this business for everything to go perfectly. Maybe you can insulate the policyholder from that, but something didn't go perfectly for you internally. Like it's tough and it's tough business, right? There's just so many things that can go wrong between like manufacturer and you call on the mill work and it should be the exact same cut of the, the, the door casing, but it's not because the blade's a little bit duller or you get the exact same flooring with the same dye lot, but all of a sudden due to either UV impact or just a different dye lot altogether. It looks mildly different. Everybody's upset, the adjuster. And the, so there's just so many things that, that can go uh, wrong. So having empathy for all that, you go, well, what is the most pain? Um, these contractors were really beholden to the policyholder holding the funds in a way that it was empowering them to, to behave in a nefarious way to the contractor's disadvantage. And this is where I'm so proud of what Surety has done and is doing. And this is how we can add value to the carrier side. Because each time there's cost that contractors realize, it gets picked up by the carrier some way, somehow. I'm so certain about that. You and I'll never be able to quantify it, Michelle, but it's real. Like Contractors can't just lose money on every job and still remain solvent. Like They pick yes. it up somewhere. Yes. And these are one of the things that we're so proud to constrain. We have a job in San Diego that is so messy. It's it's a six-figure claim. And uh, Duffy's team typically deals with all the claims, but this is the only one on his desk right now that's been elevated to the VP level. And it's like partner level. Duffy's mm -hmm. trying to figure this thing out. Yeah. And policyholder is really just not altogether that stable and doesn't have a good handle on what's going on. And frankly, the contractor kind of underperformed and we know this story. So here's surety. Like, oh. we're, I'm so proud of what Duffy's been able to do, which is like, go, hey, I can't. Both of them are asking for all the money, right? They're like, we want all, uh, all the money. Like, we yeah. did the work and this, and we're, we're uh, avoiding litigation right now in a way I'm so proud of because it's like, okay, guys, we can't, we're not, nobody's getting money until you both are happy. So we're going to need to figure out what this looks like for the final distribution of claims proceeds. And I think, Duffy, you've got that thing under control overcome by events and it would have been a bad outcome like without us like that restorer would have been screwed there was no way they were going to get to their money and we've insulated them from that we i don't know what it is about property insurance but it brings out the crazies and like <clears throat> we so insulate that so who's feeling the most pain back to your question michelle it's the restorer so yeah. uh it makes sense and i i can feel really good about what we're doing for less than a credit card fee we can protect your assets and become your collection department. Oh, and by the way, collect that deductible that just becomes a normal part of our software and process. So we relieve you of that burden. Because you and I know, Michelle, I can't train all these folks on the mid side to sell it yeah. the job the way that it should be sold. No. So how do you transcend that on scale? If you're doing a billion dollars a year as a contractor, you, you engage an unbiased third party, which is fund control. And that's kind of a new term to this industry for some folks. But for me as a GC, I engaged fund control uh, three or four times a year, large projects, policyholder directed upgrades. I want to make sure that policyholder had a quarter million dollars before I built that wing on that house. So I was paying 4% for a company to go out. The, the policyholder would have to put the 250 grand in the account and then fund control would verify it was there. And then they would distribute those proceeds to us once we hit various milestones, right? Predefined. And uh, that's that's our function. It's just it's just fund control with tech technology with a depth of understanding of, of property insurance. 
So I don't know how much you can say based on contractors who have gotten to use this a little bit of a, ahead of time, but you just gave a really good example of a, you know, a six figure claim. Do you have any other examples of how restoration contractors have used this and kind of the cost benefit analysis there of like, we are waiting this long to get paid. Now we're getting the money much sooner. Like, yeah, we're paying 4% or whatever percent it is uh, less than a credit card fee. Like instead of having our collections people do it, instead of doing it internally, like what, what kind of result or positive outcome have you seen for contractors who have used it so far? There's a lot. <laughs> it's really interesting. When we set out, we thought, okay, we're going to try to accelerate, you know, claims proceeds. And that was our goal. Then our very first job out of the gate, we uncovered fraud, wherein one, mm -hmm. the, one person claimed to be the property owner was going yeah. through all of the motions of it, was signing, signing documents with the contractor and all this stuff. We got their information. We went to the lender and realized, oh, some names match up here, mm -hmm. but not all of them. And we were able to go and find the actual property owner alleviate the contractor of any of the issues related there. This was us out of the gate, you know, trying First to claim. figure out. We just want like a $1.7 million dollar claim, mind you. Baptism yeah. by fire. That's what yeah. that's called. Mm -hmm. So we were able to immediately figure that out. We got the money flowing instantly uh, and things worked out in the end. But that's like literally our first step, our first foray into all of this was that. Um, in terms of like accelerating the claims proceeds, is once again, is something that like, this is the goal. This is the focus for a lot of contractors that want to get paid faster. Our goal is always to get that first payment within 10 days. Does it always work 33%. right now? 33%. 33%, right. That initial payment is what we call it. The first 33 um, we try to get that within 10 days. It doesn't always work perfectly. A lot of it is dependent on the lender. A lot of it is dependent on making sure, you know, our contractors working with us. There's a good explanation to the uh, property owner, which we're more than happy to take on. Um, but so long as things go well, 10 days, we'll get you those funds. And then we'll work on the next funds once you hit 50%, et cetera. That's how things function now. And it's going to only get better and easier the more we we mature, the more we have conversations with lenders, with carriers, the more they realize the benefit that we can provide to everyone within this ecosystem makes it a lot easier for us to get the release, at least of those initial funds. And oftentimes we'll talk to lenders and there's a couple who will just say, no, why would we give you any money if you haven't finished the project and we're able to actually just explain to them, hey, here's the process. You might be too small of a lender to really have gone through this before. You know, here's how we're protecting everyone, including particularly the property that you're the first mm -hmm. lien holder on. Right. Um, and we're able to many, many, many times explain to them why they can release at least a small amount to start. And we can turn around, give that to the contracting partner. And then they're getting paid money that they literally would not have seen until the end of the project. So is, every time we have a new claim that comes over, come through our desks, uh, comes through our phone lines, whatever it is, we find something new that we're able to do in order to help fix the process for both the property owner and for the contractor. What kind of feedback are you getting from the carrier side so far? Carriers, well, go for it. Go ahead. Dude, you're, you're on the front lines of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, every day. Uh, carriers are <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, not sorry. What I signed up for. Yeah. Um, <laughs> carriers are really interesting. So I've actually developed um, when I'm doing claims, I've been able to develop personal relationships with a couple of different agents, uh, you know, supervising agents, mm -hmm. even just the front lines there at the carriers who know me by name. They'll see, oh, you know, here's a phone call coming from an eight six six number. I bet that's surety. Um, and we've been able to talk with them, and I can accelerate things because of that so quickly. Um, there's others where, you know, the lenders, it's really interesting how things are like kind of in flux between the carrier and the adjuster themselves also doing things differently. The lenders and their agents all doing things differently. You know, we'll call a lender and one agent will say, this paperwork's out of date. You can't use it. We'll hang up. We'll call again. The new agent will be like, oh yeah, that's totally cool. We'll do the same thing with adjusters and carriers. I'll talk to one adjuster from, and I'm just going to pick something here from travelers um, and they'll have, you know, won't even have the time of day for anything. I'll call again, call a different adjuster, call a supervisor. Boom. We've got things flowing. We got things moving really easily. And what they, he's alluding to, Michelle, is sometimes we're 25% of the time getting the carrier just to release, just a surety mm -hmm. because we're, we exist to protect their interest yes. and they get that. And so as long as we've got a relationship with like the claims manager, they'll be like, okay, it's a surety claim. And they'll 
release uh, to Duffy. And then Duffy's job is a lot easier, right? We just do sub accounting. Okay, here's the funds for that job. And we've cut out the mortgage company altogether, which is reduces our administrative cost pretty fantastically. Um, we can invite data to the conversation now. And I can tell you guys, you restorers listen to this, like for sure, it's costing you guys 3% to process this stuff with mortgage companies and have your staff reach out and deal with all the nonsense and fax them documents. Cause that's the only way they accept stuff. It's costing you money for sure. And I know this because I have more scale than any of you guys. And I can tell you that's what's costing us. So <laughs> when a mortgage company is involved, Michelle, we don't make any money. We're just like treading water doing our thing. So we're building a business around this clunky model that it's like, okay, we're doing it at cost, right? And then my job is to develop the relationships with the carrier level, the mortgage company level, where we can create more elegant flows. But that takes surety having a master service agreement on file with Nationwide, Nationwide private client, right? And uh, we are going to uh, go at risk to protect their interest. If the mortgage company ever comes back to them with a judgment, then they can segregate against surety. Is and there then, a claim size that's ideal for surety, like getting above a certain point? Sorry if I totally just Yeah, no worries. Yeah, for us, below $73,000, we don't really want your check. But uh, for Literally 73000 Yeah, that's like the math that we've done. <laughs> it's it, like it, very- Well, think yeah. about the $7,000 checks. Like for some of our Lighthouse clients, our flagship client like ATI, who's been a great partner to us, we accept a checks of all sizes for them without a, a minimum, but nobody else is going to get that opportunity, right? They bet on us two years ago and we've built this thing around their business with an eye towards like, if we can satisfy their 31 branch offices and build software to support those flows, then we can support anybody. So they've been a good partner to us that way, but they, we process checks for them uh, you know, with a, a different fee schedule because they were first on board. Uh, we do have a minimum now for everybody else coming on board. That's a $500 minimum. So it's essentially $20,000 check Duffy, right? Like yeah. that's the break even. So we really don't want your checks under 20 grand, but okay, well, we can, we can take them. Um, I, I think this will change over time. There's a real cost to us. Like Duffy has probably 30 or 40 checks in midair right now from FedEx going back and forth across <laughs> the United States every day. And how much do you think that cost us? Like a lot, right? And then he's got a staff out to his right that's right now on the phone with lenders answering nonsense questions, right? Trying to extract, extract totally warranted dollars out of these mortgage companies. So it cost us real money to perform uh, this function. But we will get to a point where Digital endorsements, of course, of checks is like, check, like we got it. We have three banks that are swooning over us right now, trying to move yeah. towards that and win our business. And uh, we will, as we, you know, retrofit the plumbing, we like to say, to, to really cut out the mortgage company. It sounds nefarious when I say that, but what we've come to realize, and we started working with Fannie and Freddie, Michelle, to understand what Fannie happened in 19... 19- Freddie is if we were on first name basis with Fannie. A fa- Fannie. Like from the mortgage side, right? They underwrite 85% yeah. of the uh, properties in the continental United States commercial residential. And yep. so they they don't explicitly back it, but they implicitly back all these lenders. And so these lenders need to stay compliant. And so what's crazy is the Fair House, Housing Act 1978 like define this 40 point checklist that we now know about. That's asking for things like ready adjusters worksheet. That's where it's from guys, 1978. So uh, it's a really antiquated system that the mortgage companies, like they see it as a burden. Michelle, it's a non-investable asset to them. Mm-hmm. So they're booking it as a burden. They're paying millions of dollars right now to administer what their lost draft department and they're terrible at it. And so they're like, well, you know, we know Katrina went poorly. That's where like the NBA, the Mortgage Banker Association got everybody strummed up at, in 2005 after Katrina. There was a bunch of pressure from the governor to have the insurance commissioner put pressure on the carriers and carriers wrote checks without lenders on it. And then a like seriously, like hundreds of people took that check and just peaced out and yeah. then there was nothing. And yeah. so these lenders got all spun up and they're like, we need to be listening on check. Well, law of unintended consequences, 
they should have had somebody like you consulting for them. Uh, and, you know, lobbyists aren't my favorite function, but sometimes the lobbyists know what the heck's going on. They ask for something that has ended up costing them more money to service this than it's ever protected them on, on the downside. And so when we explain to the mortgage lender, like, hey, we're cutting you out, this is like a welcome notion to them, as long as they know that their interest can be preserved and we give them that solace, they're, they're good to go. They're like, they don't want to process this stuff. So it's a, it's like an interesting outcome of, you know, I, I think some led, uh, it, really not legislation, but like lobbying efforts, mm -hmm. but like the folks that led that didn't really get our space. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So on talking about the technology that's needed on the contractor side, you need a phone to be able to scan in the check and you need to be able to do 3D imaging. Is that right? Do you have to do 3D imaging through a certain technology or is that open to multiple platforms? Yeah, it's geospatial agnostic. So Matterport is the gold standard, yeah. but most restorers are using, but uh, we're open to uh, DocuSketch as, uh, as well. Um, for us, we want to put as many claims duties on the policy holder as a first order of business if it's elegant. And so Matterport is more accessible for a policy holder than DocuSketch at the outset. They both have their, their pluses and minuses, yep. right? But yep. Matterport positions itself as a B2C and a B2B brand. DocuSketch mm -hmm. is very much B2B. That shines through in this process. So we've never had a DocuSketch performed by a policy holder, but we've Got had it. plenty of Matterport scans performed by a policy holder. So we, we go through the stage of like, hey, we're going to try to get Mrs. Smith to perform the scan. If she can't, then the it's the restorer's obligation to perform it. And if the restorer can't perform it because they're too busy, not available, then we go to the Matterport scan services network. And then we commission that scan. And then we just withhold the cost associated with that cost plus from the claimed proceeds, right? Okay. So um, that's like the, the three steps and that seems to work pretty darn well, but usually our restorers are in the property anyways. Mm -hmm. And we're, we don't need like super high fidelity scans or pro two scans, which, you know, actionable recommends from a pre-mitigation post-mitigation perspective, because the pro series scans do the very best job in terms of measuring the depth data and the imaging. Um, we're just looking to confirm that the, the property is being restored. Oh, there's the mechanical, the HVAC's done, the electrical is done, the plumbing is done. Okay, like we can release 50 or 66% uh, our second tranche of funds. Um, so we can use a, a, an iPhone, right? For a policy, well, that's right. just fine. And right. you can use a 360 camera. That's just just fine for us. Because really we don't need the depth data at that point. We just need the, the imaging. And right. I... I love it from a stakeholder's perspective because you can't manipulate it. I've had ac access to the full SDK bundle, the software development kit from Matterport for six years for another venture. And me and my devs wouldn't know how to manufacture like fake plumbing and electrical. And we've been underneath the hood of that. So if we can't do it, um, I'm pretty sure that nobody else is going to be able to pull that off in a kind of way where they would be able to... Um, you know, manipulate us or engage in fraud and abuse. So that's why geospatial is uh, special to us. Um, but we're talking all about interior claims. We are not doing geospatial for exterior, but we do have a drone network where we deploy FAA 107 pilots under our direction to go and uh, collect aerial imagery. So nobody's really gotten good or it made it accessibly accessible in terms of cost for doing geospatial capture for the exterior. But of course, like that's the direction we will go. Because yeah. moving through a collection of like a hundred images sucks. When you restore send nine hundred pictures to, uh, and you co co collect it and you put it on the back of your Xactimate estimate and you send it to Alacrity or ConCon and you're like, yeah, look at like nobody looks at it. Like they look at three. Like nobody has time for that. So yeah. uh, anyhow, that's why I love geospatial data, Michelle, because you can like so quickly yeah. as a human go, okay, that's the scope of the project. Wrap your head around it. And I think it does a much better job of constraining fraud, waste, and abuse than going through a bunch of images. But that's where we're at for the exterior side at the moment. So what does it take to be a certified provider for surety? What does that mean? Yeah, it's interesting. So um, <laughs> think, yeah, I, I don't want to turn this into an actionable commercial, but you know, we need somebody who's AIMC certified in every region. We need somebody who understands the difference between a pre-mitigation, post-mitigation scan. And we don't need everybody, but we need one person who 
gets what we mean when we say, hey, we need a post repair scan. Yep. So every branch needs one AI MC certified person. So think about some of the folks we're working with ATI, 31 branches. So there's 31 individual folks that have to have an active AI MC uh, license, right? Okay. And so that's one thing. Uh, then you've got, we pull your DNB number. Um, and we have a relationship with Dun and Bradstreet. And so if you're not solvent, we're not playing ball with you. Uh, and if you, you, we need your insurance information. Um, we need to have an active contractor's license in every state where that would be applicable. Uh, and then you need to have a surety bond. And the reason it's called surety is because when you establish the master service agreement with surety, um, you are at, uh, foregoing your surety bond, like we would have primary access to that in concert with the policyholder. If we were to distribute claims proceeds, and let's say you go bankrupt, then we can make a claim against your surety bond. What we were trying to do, Michelle, is me as a GC, I've been paying for a surety bond for 14 years, and nobody's ever made a claim against my bond because I don't do silly things and piss off policyholders, but I've been paying for this insurance for 14 years. And so I thought, like, how can I protect the carrier? How can I protect surety with insurance that already exists and really is never being used. And so I'm using that. If we ever have a carrier segregate against us, then we can kick down and pull on that $250,000 surety bond um, okay. in Phoenix and so on. So we can get quick access to that cash. And that gives our carrier partner solace that we can perform financially if something really went wrong. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep, that makes sense. Okay, anything that we haven't covered that you want to talk about, either of you? In effort, well, in effort to have a, a a valid product, if I'm approaching USAA or Nationwide, which we're in the process of, I mentioned them twice, but yeah, we're in talks with them, but there's, there's other carriers as well. You have to cover your top 100 MSAs, municipal service areas. And so right now we have 61 covered, Right, but we need to round this out and get another 39 in here in the near term. So that's what I care about right now is taking care of like South Carolina, North Carolina. We don't have exposure in the state. Like that's a problem for okay. us. But we also have got areas that are oversubscribed. So we're only onboarding a maximum of three providers in each MSA. San Diego, don't bother applying. LA, don't bother applying. Uh, San, San Jose, Denver, Orlando. Uh, Houston, we have full coverage. We love you. We'll get to you maybe next year or something. But if you apply, we're not going to accept. Um, we just we just don't. Atlanta, Nashville, like covered um, because it takes bandwidth from us to onboard you, vet you. Like we're not taking everybody on our platform, right? So at any rate, uh, we're interested in the areas where we don't have coverage, right? So um, the, that's what we need to be thinking about. And like, if you're interested at all to get involved with the charity, cause there's a payment rail here to get you paid quicker and you're paying for it anyways. Um, those it's those regions that are, that are underserved where we need to fill that gap and like, help me help you. Right. Like mm -hmm. we, you have this difficult balance when you're in our position and you don't want to like over promise to your restorers, but guys, I need a network to like play with the big top 30 carriers and you yeah. want that. I want that. So I need your help. Like, getting on board and rounding out those 31 regions. And then I think surety to the moon uh, once that's accomplished. Yeah, perfect. Duffy, anything that we didn't tackle that you want to address or talk about? Um, something that hasn't really come up at all, but I think should be a really big point for contractors all around is we were kind of surprised um, and have continued to be surprised on the upside with the fact that guess who really likes surety? the property owner. Property owners have been almost across the board more enamored with what we're able to do for them, even though they don't really always understand because for the most part, they haven't actually had to go through this before. Yep. Um, they know that dealing with their mortgage lender is already a pain in the butt. They probably even get the claim packet from their mortgage lender and go, I don't know how to answer half of these things. So when we come on board and say, hey, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. You've got questions. No problem. We've got answers whenever you want. You want to you know, shoot us a little quick message in our app and we'll respond immediately. Cool. We got you. You got any other questions you need? You want to call us? Call us. You want to email us? Email us. We'll meet you wherever you're at. Um, and without really any exception, property owners have been very, very positive about their experience with us, which 
we were like, you know, that that was a not exactly the focus when we first came out of the mm-hmm. gate, but it's really grown to be a big part of the value we provide to everyone. Because a happy property owner, a happy policyholder is good news for yeah. the adjuster. It's good news for the lender. And it's great news for the contractor. Yes. I can imagine if I had a claim, I would be that person that's like, I don't know how to do this. And I don't want to mess with this. Please. Somebody that knows what this is, you do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you do it. And it's no cost to the policyholder, right? It's yes. free. So yeah, they're just relinquishing a little bit of control um, to be relieved of that burden. And um, the reviews from the policyholders have been remarkable. And we've even had thank you notes written to us, like handwritten to oh. Duffy staff of like, you guys rock. And that was a tough claim and they saw it. Right. So that's awesome. And uh, I think the fact that like we respond after hours, a lot of Duffy staff is like salaried and employees instead of hourly. So they you think of a bank, right, Michelle? It's like you need to call between yeah. hours of nine to five. We have a messaging system. So if one of Duffy's uh, analysts is like on a Saturday and it's a five second question that they can quickly answer for a policyholder to keep things moving and not wait till Monday, yep. we we function that way. And that's, you know, uh, uh, it's true to our brand of like, Hey, it's your money. Something I've always never enjoyed about like banks is you come in and you ask for cash and they ask you a bunch of questions and they act like it's their money. Right. You ever feel that way with your banking? Institution? Oh, yeah. it's like whatever yeah. we do, like we're not a bank in that sense. Like what, whosoever's money it is, it's not ours. So that tagline in the inverse, we say around the office, it's like, Hey, it's their money. And so we behave as such, but we try to respond in a level that's commiserate with what restorers are expected to do. And so if restorers want something from us, reasonably all hours, weekends or whatever else, and it doesn't take too much resources, like we just kind of keep it moving the way that they do. And uh, I, I think both sides, but the policyholder and restorer side really come to appreciate that. Love it. All right, gentlemen. Well, thank you very much. I'm excited to help get this news out to the world and see where you take it and see how long it takes you to get into those hundred markets and beyond way beyond, I'm sure quickly. So (laughs) thank you very much for your time. And I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. All right. You too, Michelle. You rock. For more restoration today, visit our website, cnrmagazine.com or find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts.